Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Yesterday, we talked about how we should consider our brothers and sisters in Christ when we embark upon any action that might hurt the faith of another. Today, we're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to dive even further into this concept as we look at Paul's personal example of the things he gave up for the gospel because the ministry of the gospel is so worth any price that he would have to pay. And so, welcome to our Key Chapters podcast. I'm Russ Brewer, pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And this is our daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of the Bible, one chapter at a time. And once again, today we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, as we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you're just turning to this chapter without reading it in its context, it might be hard to know what Paul's talking about. So we need to realize that Paul is still making the same point we looked at yesterday. And if you haven't listened to yesterday's podcast yet in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, well, then I'd encourage you just to pause this here, go back to that one before you listen to this one, because it's not going to make a lot of sense. And today is just building on the same points we were looking at yesterday. And so if you have already heard yesterday's podcast, then you will remember that 1 Corinthians chapter 8 is talking about meat sacrificed to idols. And the specific reason for this instruction was because the people of Corinth were wondering if they were allowed or if they could eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. Remember, back then, pagan temples were places where you'd buy meat. And so some people said, you, you shouldn't go buy meat at these temples because it's now been contaminated. It's been offered to idols. You can't touch that. And those folks had specific scriptures that they would point to and, and show why we can't eat meat from these temples. Now, other people said, yeah, you know what? That doesn't really matter, though, because there's no such thing as an idol anyway. And so anything that was being done there, it was all fake. And so let's go ahead and eat this meat, sacrifice idols, because that's where you get it. And it's OK. It's not a big deal. Well, the debate was causing divisions within this church and, and even hurting the faith of those who weren't sure one way or the other. Their consciences were feeling guilty if they ate, and they just, it was just causing problems all around. And so they asked Paul about this, and Paul tells them, basically, set aside this specific issue of meat and focus on what's the best thing, what's the most loving thing to do for your brother or sister in Christ. You know, the Christian life, it's not about ourselves. And, and we should not do anything that might tempt a brother or sister to sin. And therefore, we should be willing to give up even things like eating meat if that was something that was harming the peace and holiness of the church body. Now, Paul recognizes this is a huge ask. And, and he's anticipating people saying, Paul, what? You want me to give up some meat for a guy at church I hardly even know? Paul, you're asking too much. And so going into chapter 9 here, Paul is now going to just kind of bulldoze that complaint with his own personal example. And so bear with me because the first 18 verses are the same point being said over and over again from a half a dozen different angles. And Paul is just making this point, guys, you haven't even begun to think about things to give up for the gospel. And so verse 1 opens with Paul saying, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? And so Paul is starting out showing them that if anyone would have personal liberty, it would be Paul himself. He's had spiritual experiences that none of them have had. And, and yet look at the things he's been willing to change in his own life for the sake of the gospel and the spiritual health of his brethren. For starters, in verse 4, what he eats and what he drinks, it's tied to this principle. In verse 5, his lack of wife is basically related to this principle. Uh, now, these sacrifices are not because they're mandated, but rather because he's doing this for the sake of the gospel. It's just worth that much. You see, Paul's got this super wartime focus on the work of Christ. Christ is calling people out of the world into his kingdom, and Paul wants to be part of whatever Jesus is doing. And so he's so focused on advancing the gospel, he doesn't want to do anything that might detract from the work. And so he mentions in verse 7 that no soldier would fund himself in battle, and yet that's what Paul's doing. Uh, no farmer would plant seed but not eat from the harvest, and no shepherd would have this whole flock but not use any of the milk from the flock. And yet Paul is saying, guys, I'm not even asking a penny from you. Remember, back in Acts 18, he was a tent maker. He made his own tents to fund his own ministry. By his own example, he has shown them he wasn't doing it for anything for himself. Even in verse 9, Paul reminds them that God says you should give food to an ox while it's working. But Paul's not seeking to be fed. He's not seeking anything from them. And so here he is, this guy who started the church and, and funded his own ministry while doing it. And in verse 11, he would have every justification to ask them to chip in a little bit 
And yet he doesn't. And Paul's not done making his points here. So going on to verses 13 and 14, Paul points out that in the Old Testament, the priests and the Levites would be able to share in the sacrifices brought to the tabernacle or the temple. And the Lord himself had established the principle that those who serve him are to be compensated for their service. And then we come to verse 15 where Paul says, but I have used none of these things. And we're going to see in a moment that all of these sacrifices were for the sake of the gospel. And so he's not telling them this to boast. And he goes on to say in verse 15, I'm not writing these things so that it will be done. So in my case, and as he's basically saying, I'm not looking for your pity. I'm not looking for your money for it would be better for me to die than have any man make my boast an empty one. Why? Well, because Paul is absolutely compelled by the message of the gospel. He, he, he's not saying this to boast. He's just saying, guys, this is my focus. And at some level, it needs to be your focus too. And so he says in verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of for I'm under compulsion for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul had to preach the gospel. It was his calling. It was his mandate. It was his mission. It was his passion. And so in verse 18, Paul says, what then is my reward? that when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. So why does he not want to make full use of the gospel? Well, he's not quite done yet, but he says in verse 19, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I may win more. And here we see the worth and the value of the gospel ministry. Paul saw himself as a slave. Now, we saw that back in chapter 4, verse 1, so it's not a complete surprise. But Paul saw himself as a slave, a slave to everyone that he might win them to Christ. He was willing to change what he eats and drinks to win more people to Christ. He was willing to forego marriage to win more people for Christ. He was willing to serve without personal payment to win more people to Christ. This gospel call was so high and so noble and so valuable. It was worth all of this, this whole price for the eternal rewards of faithfulness to Christ. And so if the Corinthians were going to object about giving up a little thing like eating meat from a temple, they got to set their sights a lot higher. Now let's turn to verses 20 to 23, which give us a great principle about how we can follow Paul's example in reaching our world for Christ. These verses unpack how Paul is willing to give up all kinds of stuff and even embrace all kinds of stuff if that means reaching more people for Christ. And so he says in verse 20, To the Jews I became as a Jew so that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. Now, what Paul is saying here is that he wants to reach Jewish people for Christ, and he knows that the Jewish people have certain values, and if he runs up against those values, he's going to shut down his ability to preach to them. Remember, Paul typically begins his ministry when you go into these towns here. He start with the synagogues, and he can't walk into these synagogues flagrantly violating all the Jewish laws and customs traditions. He needs to respect them. He even needs to follow these laws himself so that he is fully in compliance with their regulations before even showing on up so that they have no basis to ignore him or kick him out. They've got to listen to what he's got to say and he's going to announce to them, guys, your Messiah has come. And so Paul's want to make all those sacrifices, all those changes to reach Jewish people for Christ. But remember, Paul was constantly ministering to the Jews and then the Gentiles. And so he says in verse 21, to those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. And so here Paul's referring to all the ministry he does to the non-Jews, all the Greeks, all the Gentiles. And just as Paul tried to avoid offending the Jews by violating their customs, he also seeks to honor the customs of the Gentiles. But notice the caveat he gives us in verse 21. He says, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. And so Paul's not going wild with the world. He's not joining the world's sins, just doing all the sinful things the world does. He is still fully submitted to and surrendered to God. He is still pursuing holiness himself. It's just that in those places where Paul can build bridges with the Gentiles, he will so they might reach them for Christ. And then, to tie things back to chapter 8, Paul now says in verse 22, using the same word weak that we saw back in chapter 8, remember that word weak is referring to a person who's like, I don't really know if this is right or wrong, and they're just kind of unsure. And Paul says in verse 22, to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. 
basically saying, guys, I've dealt with weak people too. And if they're not sure if something's right or wrong, I won't do it. I'm going to do whatever I can to reach for Christ. Even if that means giving up things that is almost silly because they're not even sure, I'll give it up for their sake. And so in verse 23, Paul then brings us back to the point he's been making that these concessions, giving up food, drink, wife, payment, all of this was for the sake of the gospel so he could be a part of whatever God is doing in this world. And the gospel, it's just that valuable. It's worth that much. That much sacrifice, no big deal. There's nothing that Paul wants to do that might hinder or thwart or disqualify himself from the work he's invested in. And that then leads us to the final set of verses in verses 24 to 27. Verse 24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Basically, guys, We're all in this race together, and at the end, there's a glorious prize for those who win, but it is only for those who are actually running the race, actually pursuing gospel work. Those people who can't be bothered making personal sacrifices for the gospel, those people are going to miss out mightily when it comes time for the rewards to be distributed. We saw that back in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. They're going to receive nothing. Their work is going to be just that wood, hay, stubble. It's all going to burn. They've put nothing into the work of the gospel. They've invested nothing, and therefore they will not receive a reward. And there may be people who are like, what? Well, I don't know if I want a reward. I mean, I don't want to give up like this, uh, what I'm eating there, what I'm watching over here. I don't want to give that up for the gospel. And so in verse 25, Paul says, Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. He's just pointing on out that when you're in an athletic competition, you put so much work into it. You eat right, you exercise, you train, you focus on the most minute little movements, and you do all of that so you might win a trophy. Now, for them, it was a wreath, and what's worth, it was a wreath made of leaves where the leaves would literally just die and fall off. And so people would put so much effort to something that would just last for a little while. How much more should they be devoted to things that actually last for eternity? And so for Paul, it's like, guys, I'm willing to give up anything for things that matter for eternity. And so he says, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul doesn't want to do anything that might tear down the work he's invested in. Here he has given up so much for the faith and the growth of these Corinthian believers Why would he then do anything that might harm them or jeopardize their faith or the work he's been investing in? He's not going to. And so Paul's whole point in this chapter is he is just living his life in light of eternity, in light of what's best for his brothers and sisters in Christ. And the gospel, it's worth every price he's had to pay. And if he can make such sacrifices for the gospel, well, surely they can give up something as simple as eating meat when it might cause a brother or sister to stumble. And he's just calling this church here, guys, get your focus off of yourself, off your own pride, what you know, your own experiences. Focus on things that matter for eternity and focus on your brothers and sisters in Christ and their growth and faith in our Lord. And so as we wrap up our time together today, let's be prayerfully thinking about our own life. Are we willing to make changes in our life and our habits so that we might advance the gospel? Do we have this kind of wartime mentality for the work of Christ? Or are we basically living our life, sprinkling in a bit of Jesus here and there, but we're not fully dedicated to Christ and his mission? There are many people, even I would say people who are in ministry, who are doing it for themselves. They're living for themselves. Everything they do, and even within the church, is for their own personal enrichment, their own improvement, uh, the betterment of their own kids, their own homes. And they're really not doing it for Christ, but for themselves. And the idea of actually having to give up real things for Christ, give up any distractions that would keep them from worshiping on Sundays, like give up uh, that hour to spend time with the Lord and his word and in prayer, uh, serving. They don't want to make those sacrifices because there's other things of this world, this day and age, that just seem so much more interesting and so much more compelling. And in light of eternity, in light of the wreath that doesn't perish, we should be willing to make these kinds of sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. And so here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul has given himself as an example. Not that we have to follow every single step he has taken, but we should at least begin to ask the question, what am I willing to give up for the gospel? That's a truly profound and life-changing question. So I'll leave you to think about that, and I'll sign off here. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. God bless. God bless.